Welcome to this presentation of Advice from a Double Read Weekend Warrior. I'm Terry Ewell. Some of us are fortunate to have several hours a day in which to practice and make reads. Others, however, must answer to demands, whether family or work, and this allows for only sporadic practicing and read making. For these, the performance opportunities are not weekly events, but rather the concerts might occur monthly or even less frequently. Thus, these weekend warriors, those who perform infrequently, are faced with difficult issues. How best can one maximize time with family and work and then make appropriate preparations for intensive periods of performing. There are many reasons for why a person is not able to practice every day. In my career as a department administrator and a college professor, frequently I've had to lay aside my instrument to best maximize my time. And I am not the only one. In the late 1970s, I had the honor of studying one summer with Arthur Weisberg. Weisberg was not only famous as a bassoonist, but also well known as a conductor of contemporary music and a professor at Yale University. His busy schedule, however, meant that often he could not play the bassoon every day. I remember during one lesson, he told me that he had a method for getting back in performance shape after a period away from the instrument. Unfortunately, I didn't learn about that method, but I do have some advice here for those in similar situations. Whether you've set the instrument aside due to COVID-19 pandemic, family obligations, or work requirements, I hope that this presentation will provide you with insights and strategies for how to get back into performance shape as quickly as possible. Highlights of this presentation will include definitions of endurance and general conditioning, an overview of the five components for sound production, identification of muscle groups that decline with neglect, and strategies for a vacation away from the instrument. Music puts varied challenges on the endurance and fitness of a wind performer. Philip Farkas, former principal horn of the Chicago Symphony, makes astute observations about the different performance demands. Quote, it can be observed that horn playing requires two kinds of endurance. There is general endurance, the kind that enables a player to continue playing intermittently for many hours a day. The page long solo requires a quite different type of endurance. As we compare the cross country runner's endurance with our general endurance, we might classify this ability to play for several minutes without resting as the 100 yard dash. It requires a special kind of practice, but does not necessarily demand daily work as it is very fatiguing. For the horn player, there are only a few major works which require this concentrated practice. Nearly all horn solos and concertos need this practice." End quotation. Notice that Farkas distinguishes between two kinds of fitness. First, there is general endurance, which is the ability to perform for extended periods of time with standard literature. Second is specialized endurance that is needed for extreme musical challenges. The definition for endurance that I prefer is endurance is the ability to continue in action for longer periods of time with greater efficiency. 
Notice that there are two components to this definition, duration and efficiency. We will keep the Farkas observations and my definition in mind as we further explore endurance for the double read player in this presentation. Let's consider some of the pinnacle events that could happen in a double read player's professional career. Playing Wagner's opera, Die Meistersinger, uh, the uncut version is five hours and 15 minutes. Wow. The longest symphony is by Mahler, symphony number no. three, that's 95 minutes. The Hummel bassoon concerto is 27 minutes. Strauss oboe concerto, 25 minutes. The, uh, some of the longest phrases occur in the Tchaikovsky Fourth Symphony. You've got the oboe solo that goes on for 40 seconds or more, depending on the tempo chosen. And the uh, bassoon solo in that second movement of Tchaikovsky Fourth is uh, 30 seconds or more. There are stresses put on the performers in terms of articulation speed. We've got the Overture to Bartered Bride by Smetna at 160 for 16th notes. You've got Rossini's Silken Ladder, the oboe uh, solo. Beethoven's Fourth Symphony, the fourth movement solo for bassoon. And Mendelssohn Midsummer Night's Dream uh, with the very fast 16th notes in there. So uh, this puts certainly a stress on articulation. The pinnacle events I just mentioned put stress on different parts of the body. Now, these are not routine events during which general conditioning or general endurance will suffice. These called for specialized endurance. These pinnacle events I just mentioned put stress on different parts of the body. For instance, some of the endurance activities would certainly put stress upon the lungs. These long solos in the Tchaikovsky Symphony would do that. The fast-tongued passages discussed would certainly put stress on the tongue. In addition, some of these works would provide extreme demands on the oral muscles and embouchures. The important thing to know about these five different components for sound production is that each of these components makes use of muscle fibers that respond in similar ways to stress and to work, whether you have the, the uh, respiratory uh, mechanism here, the diaphragm brings in air, you've got abdominal muscles and other muscles that push out air. The second uh, number here is in the throat area this is a place where many people, uh, such as myself, have the vibrato mechanism. And there are many different uh, musculature structures in this area. It's extremely complex that uh, can be used to produce vibrato. And uh, various uh, studies on vibrato have shown that different structures are used for that. Uh, I provide a lot of details for these various components in my uh, published work on Lulu, which is given here as a reference. Uh, the number three is the back of the tongue. Uh, that could be used for tuning. That can also be used for the K or G syllable in a double tongue. Number four is the front of the tongue, which is the most common place to have your articulation. And uh, then number five is the, the embouchure. So each of these components engage muscle fibers. And similar to each kind of muscle fiber, you can increase endurance in those fibers, you can increase efficiency in those fibers. Those are the fibers that uh, you, you feel stress in, that you feel fatigue in uh, when you engage those, those muscles over and over again. I uh, just want to uh, give uh, just another point here. Um, the important part of the way I view playing is to view each of these five components as operating independently. And because they can operate independently, 
you can create a greater variety in your sound and uh, greater abilities for musical expression if indeed you master each of these uh, numbers, each of these components independently. Just a quick overview of the muscle types we find in the body. Uh, type 1 muscles are the slow twitch fibers. These are dense with uh, capillaries. Uh, they primarily work with oxygen and that they are, are fiber, fibers that uh, are built for endurance for activities that go on over and over and over long uh, time. Uh, for instance, long distance runners have more of this type 1 type of muscle fiber than the, the fast fibers. The, uh, the type 2A, 2X are the fast twitch muscle fibers. Uh, they tend to give a very quick uh, response, but then they, they don't give that quick response over longer periods of time. Uh, these can all be developed in different ways, and there is targeting for those. I mentioned some of that again in that uh, book that I've written on endurance. The different components of your body are actually a mix of these fibers. So it's not that you find all type 1 fibers and all type 2 fibers in a certain location, uh, although there are different concentrations in areas, but there is there's often a mix. Uh, one thing you may have noticed, for instance, if you're talking about the front of your tongue and the, and the back of your tongue, actually the top part of your tongue that I mentioned here as component three, is these have different fibers in them. The front of our tongue is blessed with a lot more of the fast twitch fibers than the back of the tongue. And that's the reason, for instance, you may find that if you were to try to say over and over again, you'll find you get much more fatigue than if you say the the front of the tongue with the T sound over and over again. It's you've got more fast twitch fibers here than you do at the back of the tongue. And that uh, makes a difference for the responsiveness that you have with articulation and uh, the way in which you use articulation on our instruments. All of these muscle types can be increased in power and efficiency through use and exercise. One can strengthen all five components at the same time through regular practice. Philip Farkas termed this general endurance in the quotation above. However, each component can be targeted more efficiently with a unique set of endurance building exercises. By doing so, a person can more swiftly increase muscle development and control in that component. This has precedence in sports and weightlifting where certain skills or certain muscle groups are targeted with carefully crafted exercises and regimens. Targeting certain areas is particularly helpful if one has identified an area of weakness. Now, everyday life stresses the five muscle groups of the five components of sound production differently than playing on the instrument. Some of the five components receive adequate exercise to maintain general conditioning for performance. For instance, if I maintain a vigorous exercise regimen with aerobic and muscle building exercises, I find no diminishing of the muscles needed for blowing air into the instrument. This is not the case, however, for the embouchure and oral muscles. After a period of, away from the instrument, I notice these muscles very quickly fatigue. It is for that reason that I've developed a special exercise to target those muscles. In addition to the loss of muscle strength during a vacation period, I also notice loss of finesse. This is not just a matter of muscle fitness, but also one of muscle efficiency. Dynamics and control over tonal nuances quickly degrade, often in just a few days. Careful control of the tiniest movements are easily lost. The dance between the embouchure and the reed 
requires both to be in top shape. If either are even slightly lacking, the tango doesn't go well. The worst mistake that a performer can make is to end the last note of the concert, lock the instrument in the case, and give no further thought about preparing for the break and the process of getting back into performance shape. Time spent preparing for the break immediately after the last performance will be rewarded with quicker transitions back to performance fitness. A day to a day and a half after the final concert are golden hours for read adjustments. During this time, the embouchure is in shape and well sensitized to how high performance reads should be working. Those precious hours must be put to good use by preparing new reads for the period of time after the vacation from the instrument. In these hours with the best reads at hand, it is easier to compare and contrast the ideal reads with developing reads and trim the new reads in proper ways. Make certain that the instrument is packed away only after a good assortment of well-adjusted reeds of all ages are available. By all ages, I mean those reeds that are concert proven, older, concert ready, mature but not old, and developing younger. Be sure to engage in healthy habits during the vacation away from the instrument. Continue your exercise routines with aerobic and muscle strengthening exercises for your whole body. Aerobic exercises such as running, cycling, or working out on elliptical machines are particularly helpful for maintaining the performance conditioning of the lungs. In addition, exercises that target the arms, shoulders, and back will help to keep in shape muscles needed to support the instrument, particularly the bassoon. Sleeping well and eating well will further help the transition back to the stresses of concert performances. Special consideration should be given to how one will get back into performance condition. And I think that adopting a strategic approach will help minimize the time getting back into shape. Here I present a sample practice session that can be used as a practice regimen for getting back in shape. Uh, just keep in mind though that th because this is simply a sample, it doesn't mean that you have to adopt it uh, line by line rigorously and uh, not depart from it. Of course, you should adopt this according to the conditioning of your body, according to what you can do, and, and perhaps even your time schedule. It may very well be that the first day or two, you're only doing part of this sample session and you're easing to get back in shape. Of course, you want to avoid any sort of injury. So let, let's just uh, discuss a bit this chart and take a look at several important features that uh, reflect current research on optimal athletic performance. It's important to know that I developed this by looking at the research into athletes and the way in which to best use interval training and other activities to increase their endurance. So uh, starting here, uh, giving yourself a time of warm up is very important. Uh, just like an athlete, you need to warm up the muscle tissues and this helps avoid injury, but also uh, gets you into a position in which you can stress, stress the muscles, stress the body more in order to build endurance and get yourself back into shape. So I've allowed here about 10 minutes for warm up scales, uh, arpeggios. This should be easy, fluid work. You're not uh, pushing yourself with any sort of endurance activity, but instead you're just simply trying to warm up the muscles and uh, just get a feel of that embouchure on the reed and getting the lungs working, fingers working and all of that. Now, the next thing, and this is, this is the important part of the practice regimen, is this issue of interval training. Interval training puts stresses on muscles 
in a very concentrated period of time in which you are working towards fatigue. And it's important to, uh, to use that. So uh, this would be your interval training session one. Here, here's a video example of that uh, session fatigue. <laughs> Let me point out a few features of this chromatic endurance exercise that I've developed. Uh, notice first you play until fatigued. You don't have to complete this exercise when you reach the point of fatigue, then stop. And again, you need to be the best judge of how far to push your body. If at the end of the exercise you're not fatigued enough, then simply repeat it or repeat a portion of it. On bassoon, the most fatiguing portion, I find, is the, t the last half of the exercise, less so in the first half of the exercise here. Uh, notice that I've got uh, pianissimo de mezzo forte for lip endurance. That's if you just want to target the embouchure muscle group. If you want to primarily target the intraoral endurance, this is the inside of your mouth and the muscle structures there, then you need to play forte or fortissimo. Now, this also 
taxes the embouchure. So you're doing both a double duty with the forte to fortissimo. But it, you can really target the inside of your, your mouth and, and those, uh, those structures in there with uh, greater endurance. And obviously, uh, that also taxes the, uh, the lungs as well because you're expelling uh, more air with, with all of that. This is the uh, chromatic endurance exercise for bassoon. I've also created a chromatic endurance exercise for the oboe. Uh, both of these exercises will be published in the double read in a forthcoming article. Now let's go back to our sample practice session. We've completed the warm up, 10 minutes or so. The interval training could be three minutes, could be two minutes, could be four minutes, however uh, your session works out. And then very important after the interval training is to have a period of what's called active rest. They have found with working with sprinters, with other athletes, that once you do your interval training, instead of having the athlete just sit down, they should be engaged in an activity where the muscles are moving and where there is a continued motion. So for instance, a sprinter might do their sprinting and then they may go to do some stretches or walking or something like that. So for us, active rest would be practicing some difficult finger patterns, a rhythmic passage, some articulation. The idea being is that you work with another muscle group. We don't want to stress the embouchure. We don't want to stress the inside of the mouth or perhaps even endurance with the lungs. And so we'll continue to use those, but engage in something else. And see, this becomes very efficient because there are usually some things you need to work on in a concert, uh, fingering wise, uh, articulation wise, something like that, which would be helpful there. So having finished there, the warm up, the interval training one, the active rest, then is time for your second interval training session. So once again, you do the same routine you did in the first interval training session. You find you may be more quickly fatigued. That's quite common. And then I've uh, allocated a place here for a break, just being away from the instrument. That's roughly half an hour into the session. And I think it's important that you really get away from the instrument. So put the instrument down, don't make reads, get up, walk around, have a cup of tea, uh, give yourself a break and uh, even maybe not even thinking about music. You will find that your practice session is much more fruitful when you allow your subconscious to some time to work on what you were doing and allow your conscious mind to be engaged in something else. So having taken a little break from the instrument, come back for some more active rest. Maybe you work on some arpeggios, some scales, some other patterns that uh, need some touching up. And then if you're able to do it, now follow up with your third interval training session. And uh, this, this really uh, three times having this uh, fatiguing things will, uh, will definitely help you get in shape. Followed that again by some active rest and then, then a break away from the instrument. Here is a uh, weekly regimen that you, you might want to be involved with. For instance, day one, your first session, you've got some interval training. If you did a second session, then definitely practice without the interval training. Day two, you may decide that you're not going to do the interval training on day two and uh, practice on some other things. And then maybe day three, bring in the interval training. Again, you're going to have to uh, see how your body best responds, but consider ways in which you can alternate stressing muscle groups and then, then perhaps giving a day off. Stressing muscle groups, giving a day off, much as a weightlifter would do or, or somebody in, in sports and athletics. The best way to keep yourself practicing is to keep your practice sessions interesting. So vary the kinds of things you're doing. Keep yourself physically challenged. Keep yourself mentally stimulated. All of that is so important to keep up your practice regimen. 
Let me give one last comment on playing the reeds after the break. Even a well-adjusted reed will take several days to adapt to performance conditions. At first, the reeds and the embouchure will feel foreign and uncomfortable. Resist the urge to scrape the reeds. The reeds also need several days to get back into performance condition. Trust the procedure and allow the embouchure and reeds to come back into performance shape. Well, I hope that this presentation has been helpful to you. The keys to a quick rebound to performance after a break are to pay careful attention to preparations before the break. Keep up a healthy lifestyle while away from the instrument. Last of all, apply a systematic approach to regaining endurance. All these steps will result in success. We are fortunate that the human body is so resilient and able to reestablish past endurance levels. Applying a few of the strategies provided in this presentation should help you to quickly return to performance shape. Thank you for your time. Bye. Thank you.